I've wasted so much time trying to connect to a phone banking executive or trying to sort out the various IVR menus. I'm honestly surprised I've ever managed to get any banking work done. Thankfully now with the Jupiter Digital Banking app, these things are finally in the past. Their super easy to use app simplifies banking in a way we've never seen before. They have a 24/7 chatbot live on their app which connects to a human within seconds if you need. In case of more complicated interactions, you get a ticket number which can be tracked to determine where your query or complaint is and by when it can be resolved. So check out jupiter.money to find out more or download the Jupiter app on Android and iOS to get started. Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach podcast. I am Ashton Doctor, your Habit Coach, and today with us for a second time we have Doctor V in the house. Now, if you haven't heard the first part, please go and make sure you listen to that because we are continuing from there onwards, where we are talking about chronic lifestyle diseases and what are the things that you can do from now onwards to take care of them. Yesterday, I was having a thali yes. lunch with somebody, and you were like, "So we are vegetarian, vegetarians," and I was like, "Yes, but your plate has no vegetables." right because there was a there was Lentil. chana hmm. there was dal there was rice there was a potato sabzi there was tomato and kakdi as salad so out of them the only, kakdi was the only vegetable right nothing else was a vegetable yeah. but everything else was technically part of the vegetarian diet yeah that's true so how do we end up putting more vegetables in and how do we know what is a vegetable that is good for us in that context so my standard thing to all my patients is is eat everything that grows above the ground mm. so no root vegetables no potato sweet potato corn mm. and some you know root vegetables that are loose you don't think that you might eat everything else is okay okay eat every other vegetable that you like barring those three mm. it doesn't matter everything and above ground is fair game is fair game mm. yeah. um leafies versus um non leafies is always better mm. anything that has more fiber is always better the mm. same goes for a fruit right? mm. so anything that's more fibrous will always keep your sugar in control okay that is the premise of everything really mm. keeping your blood sugar your insulin your leptin down mm. so that you don't get insulin resistance correct so keeping that um so blood sugar down as much as possible one way is to have lesser carbs the yeah. other way is to have protein and good fat have protein and good fat as part of that meal always as part of a meal the mm. meal should be a balanced meal mm. So what our ancestors said and I say this also all the time you know you can't pick up what you liked from your ancestors and just pick that part mm. you know my ancestors ate bolus of rice but your ancestors also worked out and they also you know ate non gmo food non pesticide food they slept much earlier they, they woke had to up hunt much for earlier. it they had to dig yes. for it yes and they also ate so much more protein correct so you should eat that so coming to protein mm. then mm. um So every let's understand every food group all the three macros will increase your sugar. Mm. It's just that the rate at which it increases your sugar is most in carb, fair amount in protein and fats actually increase your sugar the least. Mm. So for every diabetic hearing this make good fat your friend if you want to control your sugar. Correct. Yeah. And and hunger. And of course and mm. hunger absolutely correct. Mm. And immunity. Mm. Immunity also. Oh yeah. because of course. Mm. Absolutely yes. Mm. Um so protein mm. is great for you I so the kind of diets I prescribe is the anti-inflammatory what I call the anti-inflammatory diets actually have medium amount of protein they're not very high protein diets I'm not in favor of very high protein mm. also remember very high protein will also cause the insulin surge mm. therefore people who begin their day with like say a protein shake for instance Correct. I'm not a big fan mm. yeah I'm not a big fan of anything artificial anyways mm. but not to begin with a protein shake where you're going to get that sugar influx and that insulin. absolutely so have medium protein and have good quality bioavailable protein mm. with every meal and you're good so don't be obsessed you know people are obsessed i want 2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight i'm like help see somebody else please huh? that's 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 a, that's a lot of protein also um vegetarians talk about the how to balance the protein out as well right because you don't have the dal no dal and But there's ample protein for vegetarians. You can do paneer, tofu, cheese, sprouts. Sprouts increase the protein content significantly. With sprouts, also do you need to mix them with rice, or just have sprouts by themselves? Depends on what, how much carb you're eating in the day. Hmm. So I typically tell my patients you want to have, you know, 
a rice meal or roti meal, whatever, for one meal, mm. and you want to have it with your sprouts or dal or rajma, or whatever, works. No problem at all. Mm. As long as it's all about the balance. Mm. As long as you begin your begun your day with protein and you're ending with protein and vegetables. You said something very interesting. Mm-hmm. Do you want to have a rice meal or a, a chapati meal? Right. We we define our meals by the main carbohydrate. Yeah. Right. And Which is why we're the diabetic capital of the world. Isn't it? I will always just, you know, push bring that it, in. Bring it back down. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so true because I keep consciously, in fact, one of the habits that we had probably discussed, if not, we're going to put this on in, in the Habit Coach podcast, Zara, please remind me, yes. is about um, how do you refer to what you're going to eat? Am I going to eat a rice thing? So how many rotis will I eat today is how we typically define what we're going to be eating. Yeah. Instead of what sabzi we're eating or what protein we're eating. I think no, no, we've grown up like that. So everything's carb driven. Ah, we have to change that as a habit and as a lifestyle thing. True. Lovely. True. Okay, so so make sure that you're getting enough fats. Make sure that you're getting the right protein. Don't be protein obsessed don't because be protein that's also obsessed. going to increase. And the idea is with your food to do things that don't create that inflammation. That's right. right? Um, sugar being the primary one, seed oils being the next. Um after nutrition, what is the next step that people typically should focus on in order to keep the inflammation low? Gut health. Okay. So we're still in the food zone. No, gut health is not necessarily food. You okay. Can give, you can give a lot of supplements. You can think it's not necessarily food based, right? Because... Um, explain, explain, explain. See, everything eventually starts in the gut. So for people who come to me saying, I've got a gut issue, I wake up feeling bloated and I'm constantly belching or I'm not pooping well, Indians are obsessed with their poop. <laughs> so, no, so I'm not, you know, then you need to figure out, is your gut not functioning well? Why is it not functioning well? Do you have a leaky gut? Which mm. means, are you inflamed? Is your gut inflamed? Mm. Is that because of food? Is that because of non-food? Meaning you could be having... You could have had a loss, long course of antibiotics, not replenished with uh, probiotics. You could have had very high periods of stress. So it's not necessarily food driven. It's not necessarily food. Fair. Yeah? Hmm. So, and then you, if it's food driven, then of course you need to add prebiotics. You need to add probiotics. I, you know, add even oral prebiotics, uh, probiotics, depending on. And now we get different supplements of probiotics based on your condition. Okay. So there are certain probiotics which will you know i give people if they've just if they tell me they've just finished a course of antibiotic mm. if you're stressed upset depressed i'll give you a different strain of anti- of probiotics mm. yeah so there's enough documented study on this now it's quite fascinating wow so okay so if, if i um how do i approach gut health i'm listening to this podcast and i'm saying okay what are three things that i can do right now to take care of my gut what would those three things be First one is, of course, remove all the sugar and remove all the pro-inflammatory foods like we've spoken about. Mm. And then you introduce stuff. Okay. So you introduce probiotics. Take omega-3s. Omega-3s are very they're anti-inflammatory. Mm. So they will calm your stomach down. Uh, prebiotics, whether it's, you know, your, your vegetables or uh, in, in whatever form that you want to take in fruit, etc. So you take your prebiotics. You wouldn't necessarily do inulin or add inulin no, or something. not mm. really. Not, mm. not required. And you look at the... Um, you know, if, if somebody is constipated or if someone's, you know, got IBS, it's got, then, then you give specifics based on Correct. It. If you have a particular issue, obviously that is yeah, different. Yeah. Um, but overall, add more probiotics. Yeah. People say, huh, I'm having dhai. Is that enough? Not at all. Okay, so? Not at all. Hmm. So you give a probiotic supplement hmm. and you have to give a probiotic supplement that typically has at least one billion strain. More often than not, the probiotic needs to be kept in a fridge. People keep the probiotic out near the sun and then, you know, what you're taking is... It's nothing. So not the stuff that you would uh, buy in capsules on Amazon. Would that work as a probiotic or that? Yes or no. Hmm. And yes and no, depending on the kind of probiotic. Okay. So you'll have to see the strain and hmm. you'll have to see whether it needs to be kept in, you know, refrigerated or if it's okay to be kept out. No, bro- no probiotic is okay kept out in the sunlight. Hmm. So you need to look at that and you need to add your omega-3s. Are there any blanket statement supplements that we can say that you should use for your gut? Like omega-3s are understood. In probiotics, any blanket statement? I once. actually don't think any supplement can be given blanket. Okay. Including omega 3s. Mm. For people who have got like, you know, blood thinning, thinning issues and are on aspirins or propitagrills, I would not necessarily give omega 3. It might, you know, make the blood thinner. Mm. So I don't think anything in the health realm mm. should be a blanket without statement. supervision. Mm. So supervise and then do it. 100%. Fair. Fair. So, um, so probiotics primarily from supplements or, or supplements. Does, does the kombuchas and no, all of no. those supplements Supplements are the yes. main way of doing this? That's right. Okay. And speak to your doc about which ones, depending on which aspect of your lifestyle you want to work on first. Love it. 
Pre biopsy. Like, sorry, mm. uh, I was just going to say lifestyle intervention, like inter- like intermittent fasting, usually helps the gut. Mm. So you know you can always you look at sleep, you look at. That's a good one, fasting. right? So like because you're giving your gut a break. Yes, absolutely. Mm. You know, giving your 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 gut time to heal. So you know, intermittent fasting works brilliantly for gut. Like I keep it telling works people, brilliantly for most things. I, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but like every time we eat something, we're technically putting a foreign object into our body. right and our body is trying to get out as fast as possible because like you know imagine you have a foreign object floating around yeah. that's actually what food is yeah. and uh, people freak out and say how can you call food a foreign object it is my life like to like you have to understand it from that point of view similar perspective on your yeah, side yeah for sure i think we spend as much time at work as we do eating it's the center of everything especially in this country everything celebratory your morning your everything is revolving around food And so, and once you start fasting, it gives you a sense of power. You know that I'm not dependent on this, right? And I think that's also because for it me. makes you feel so good. It makes you feel damn good. Your energy levels actually surge, and in terms of health, think what it does to you. It actually increases your growth hormone. You know, it increases your muscle mass, and you know that the ghrelin and leptin hormone that I was talking about. It sets the balance right, mm-hmm. so you feel that that feeling of satiety comes mm-hmm. naturally. and so much faster when you're fasting and people don't get that initially they look at you saying why are you being so ba-? you know like you you're being, being so mean, mean to me really you're being so mean to me you're being <laughs> claw, like you know why do you want me not to eat i'm like try it two weeks mm. and just begin small start small to 12 hours and see what it does to you vishaka i love your two weeks thing huh? it's just like two no for two weeks to two we hafte mein aap mujhe de sakte hain carrot has to be <laughs> <laughs> and then they come back saying wow i feel look superb huh yes Yes, and of course, people who are diabetics, they see their sugars falling. Correct. People who have gut issues, they they find their gut issues resolving. Mm. So I mean, you know, I've had like all sorts of recovery happen with people on intermittent fasting. Mm. I do think I have to say again, but that is a caveat. I do think people again do it unsupervised mm. and do very long fasts mm. and dry fasts. And I'm not a big fan. Mm. I think everything has to be done supervised. Mm. I think there are conditions where people. you know where the hormonal bal- imbalance can happen initially and there is a group of people who should not be doing intermittent fasting mm. is there so, a, is there a list of stuff that if you do have this 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 don't do intermittent fasting well i would say pregnant women definitely It's not correct. breastfeeding lactating women definitely not um if you've just come out of like um very stressful phase in your life definitely not i didn't give my patients who more on my program and who's you know had covid in the midst of it i told them to stop intermittent Correct. fasting because your body is already going through a lot Absolutely. of stress those people people who have um food issues mm. meaning people who've been bulimic anorexic okay. definitely not mm. they are not a candidate for if at all mm. so those people and people who've just come out of big surgeries mm. should not do if at that point now people with hormonal imbalances which is half the condition mm. so when you're doing you know when you've got hypothyroid diabetes all that also under medical supervision only because i do see morning sugar surge fasting going up then the patients get really nervous and get scared and all of that so monitor so the the hormonal issues definitely monitor along with your doctor for the intermittent fasting how do you have this conversation with your doc about um, intermittent fasting there's so many doctors who are against it right yeah do you just keep searching for somebody who is not my name is dr vishal <laughs> <laughs> Instagram below in the link. Reach out, DM. Plug. <laughs> Plug. <laughs> yeah. But like, like, it, it, like, I know five years ago it was a big issue. Like when people saying, but my doctor is saying intermittent fasting is rubbish. Like, get out. And, you, know. you know, I find that question very difficult to answer only because I've had so many arguments with my colleagues, with my medical colleagues, and they're like, "What are you doing? Why are you doing this kind of thing?" Hmm. And on an average, I treat ten doctors a week at my clinic now. So we have come such a long way. So if anyone tells me anything, I'm like, do you want me to give you a list of doctors who come to me, mm. like, and who we've done? So, I mean, so it's just changed their lives. Mm. They've reversed their conditions and they're feeling. And now those doctors refer patients to me. And coming from a start point where people said, "What now? You started practicing nutrition? Ah. You know, you didn't like medicine." Mm. So from there to now, actually sending me medical conditions to reverse. So it's such a you know so I'm guessing you need to find either those doctors who've been to me, 
<laughs> but I hope there is on a serious note. I do hope yeah. that there is a mind shift and there is because I think there is so much. But last five years, you're seeing it. So it's, it's happening slowly, slowly. Also, because sadly, I think in India, we ape the West so much. Yeah. And there are so many big names now in the West, big doctors mm. who are so promoting it so openly. Mm. So, you know, and these these are doctors who are now from Harvard and MIT and this and that. And, you know, that they're all talking about it and they're all over social media. So people come to you saying, Dr. So-and-so said this. Is there any merit in this? Mm. I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, wherever the source came whatever, from, whatever, we mm. don't care as long as you're going to make a change and, you know, going to make a difference to your life. Correct. So I think that shift is happening. Lovely, lovely. Now, one of the things that you mentioned in terms of the, uh, the entire inflammatory thing is stress. Yeah. Now, how do you help people with stress? You know, like what are the habits that you would first tell them to do about stress? Like stress is one, you know, like one formless thing in people's minds. Yeah. Also, it's very easy for me to say don't stress. Huh, all of like, us stress. Correct. I mean, you know, I stress all the Both time. What stress? So. Hey, you know, it almost becomes like a blanket statement for things. Yeah. But how do you break it down as a doc? I think I you need to tell them whatever the stress is. Very often the, the trigger of the stress may not go. It may be a family member who is ill or it might be a financial issue. And like I said, it's all okay for me to preach. But if that trigger, if that situation is still there, if that's not going to change. The only thing that you can change is your response to it, mm -hmm. which is true for most things in life, right? So what I tell everybody is what I do. Mm -hmm. I say you begin your day A with gratitude mm -hmm. because you cannot be stressed when you come from a place of gratitude. It's just not possible. Number so, one habit. This yeah. is correct. Yeah. I personally begin my day and my day with gratitude. Mm. That's, that's something that's not negotiable. Mm. You do that. Mm. The way you breathe makes a big difference to your response to stress. Mm. So anytime where you feel you're really angry, upset, mm. you know, stressed because of something, just take a five minute break. And that's all it takes. Just mm. take a five minute break. Just say, I want to be on my own. Step into your room, your balcony, go down. Just don't go down and smoke. Hmm. Do whatever it takes. Um. And just focus on your breath and slow it down. Just actively slow it down. So whether you want to do a box breathing, which is the same count of inhale, hold, exhale, hold. Whether you do that. Or what I find is very powerful is when your exhalation is twice that of your inhalation. Hmm. Now, when you do this, even if it means two counts for somebody else or four counts. It doesn't matter what the count. But if your inhalation is half that of your exhalation, you trigger your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body, which is what I call the stress antidote. It's, it's a nerve that once triggered, reduces your heart rate, reduces your pulse rate. You know, when you're really stressed, you'll never find somebody who's really calm, speaking slowly, saying you're always like hyperventilating and you're always like in that state, right? Correct. When you when you trigger that vagus nerve, that stops immediately. Your blood pressure stops. Uh, I mean, not stops, mm. but your blood pressure <laughs> comes <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> comes down. Your blood sugar, which because when you're stressed, your cortisol level goes up. Correct. And when your cortisol level goes up, your sugar goes up. When you, when you activate your vagus nerve, that also reduces immediately and mm. it takes just a few minutes of doing it. So that's the first thing you need to do. Just get away from the trigger for five minutes and just focus on your breath, either to the box breathing or you do something that will just activate your vagus nerve and that is in your control. Any other um, habits or st stimulations that you can do for your vagus nerve that you would enjoy? Yeah, you can just splash your face with cold water and that will trigger the vagus nerve. Mm. And Again, I mean, if you don't, don't want to be nice to your neighbors or your family members, just saying hum, mm. humming, humming is <laughs> humming. a big one. Yeah, it, it mm. really does. Mm. I do it all the time. Mm. I hum really loudly. I, <laughs> you know, sorry for people around me, but uh, it really helps me de-stress. So during the last two years, mom started this humming practice in the morning. Mm. It was too funny because mm. you'd be walking around with your coffee and you'd suddenly hum, <laughs> walking past you. <laughs> Yeah, so, so humming is again a, a yes. vagus nerve thing that you yes, can... Yes, it stimulates like, the vagus nerve. Correct. Yeah. What, what else? What else can we do to... Um, because the vagus nerve is a long nerve, right? It's, yeah, it's the starting one that, from the base of the cranium and going down to the lower abdomen. A huge one. It's just, Longest it's, nerve in the body. It's a wandering nerve. That's why it's called That's the vagus correct. nerve, That's right? That's correct. That's Fantastic. Correct. So getting that in place, calming that down, at least activating. It's yeah. activating it. Right? That's Not right. Calming. Activating. Activating the vagus. the vagus nerve makes a big difference. Lovely. So you're not looking at stress again from don't stress beta. It's actually ye cheech karo, do these things and you will start calming yourself down in this moment. Because don't stress beta is not a solution. Hmm. 
I'm very pro solution. Correct. So, you know, you come to me with a problem, I'm going to give you an actionable thing to do. You know, and I hope that helps. Gratitude, vagus nerves, limitations of breathing. What, what, what you said three. So, what was the third one? Um, I, the kind of breathing. The kind of breathing. Yeah. Okay. And sleep. And it's sleep. Huge. Of course, I also did supplements then, which help, <clears throat> which help with stress. But sleep is huge. Now, when you're very stressed, it's difficult to sleep well. Mm. So I might say, you know, I have a good night's sleep, I have a long, but you're stressed, you're constantly waking, you're looking at your ceiling and Correct. then, you know, and then you're probably abusing me saying, what the hell? You know, every <laughs> you know? crack in your ceiling. <laughs> yeah. huh. um, but, um, so I like to give supplements which then help with sleep. So I like to give magnesium and melatonin, mm -hmm. which are my favorites, special magnesium, because mm. magnesium also calms you down. Which version of magnesium? So it depends what you're giving it for. Mm. So if you're giving for stress, maybe glycinate. If I'm giving it for, because magnesium has so many functions, Correct. right? It helps with constipation, it helps with muscle relaxation. So different magnesiums you'll give for different things. So for, I'm not for, a big fan of oxide. But sorry. So for sleep, glycinate typically, right? Um, what are the other? Epsom salt, which is magnesium also. Okay. I would give that sulfate. I would give that for, you know, just relaxation, mm. that kind of thing. So, but not Epsom salts as in like go and have loose motions when, when you do your gut cleanse and not not for that. No? I'm not a big fan. Huh. I'm Correct. not a big fan. Mm -hmm. you just eat clean. That's your normal cleanse. Yeah, because your body is technically supposed to be cleansing itself all the and time. And we have so many detoxification organs. Mm. I mean, the, the skin being the largest one. It's so, supposed to be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so good. So we got our cleanses out of <laughs> We've cleansed ourselves <laughs> of cleanses. Lovely. Hey, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcasts Network. On Shunya One, Sheila Ditya speaks with Sakshi Vij, founder and CEO of Miles Cars, about her entrepreneurial journey. On Cyrus Says Cock and Bull, Cyrus, Sara, Kajol and Antariksh discuss how a passenger with no flying experience lands a plane at the Florida airport. On All Things Policy, the Takshashila folk analyze the state of abortion policy and access in India. On Naan Curry, Sadaf and Archit explore and celebrate indigenous cheese with Dr. Kurush F. Dalal. And on The Habit Coach, Ashden shares tips on how to tackle FOMO. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcasts has just launched its merch and our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcasts website and click on the Shop tab to check out our first collection of t-shirts. Do follow us on social media via IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Don't forget to rate us on any platforms you're listening on. You can also check us out on YouTube. We are also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate if you could spare a few minutes to fill it. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week. SBI Life Insurance, Jupiter, a digital banking app, and Cap Gemini. Get the future you want. So what are your top three habits for sleep? So one is, like you said, there were supplements, so magnesium, melatonin. What are the other things that you typically tell people when it comes to sleep? Keep your phone away from you for at least an hour before because the blue light is going to do nothing for your melatonin, mm. right? So you're blocking that melatonin production. So whether it's the phone, even people who knock the blue light off and say, oh, maybe you're using the phone, but you're stimu it's a neurostimulant. Correct. So you need to keep your phone away. You need to keep all gadgets, whether it's your, um, you know, your, your television, your LED lights have blue lights. So all those need to be shut an hour before. That's very important. Uh, I think there's something called neuroassociation, which means your, when you go to your bedroom, you should go just at the time where you want to sleep. Mm. You can't be reading there and eating, you know, watching TV and eating there and doing everything in your bed. Then that's not, so there has to be a neuro association. Correct. So maybe just hit your bed half an hour before bedtime. I also think you need to have like a sleep hygiene. So your, um, your, your bed needs to be really clean. Your, um, if you, if you have the AC on, it needs to be typically about 20 degrees, apparently reduces your core body temperature, which induces good sleep, sleep. which has been documented now. So you need to do those kind of things, you know, make sure it's not like a hot bedroom, make sure you're uh, in comfortable clothing, have a long, warm shower before you sleep, mm -hmm. switch off your blue light, all these things, and then take your supplements, all of them will help. Correct. All of these add up together to give you that good quality sleep that we want at the end. It's always everything adding up together. There is no magic bullet. There is no magic supplement. There is no superfood. I mean, somebody asked me, some magazine called me up correct. yesterday saying, 
what is the latest super food? I'm like, there was never a super food that was, you know, a sup- <laughs> one particular food is never going to make you like Bruce Lee. So not happening. <laughs> I love that. What is the latest one? Yeah. And we're constantly coming up with new, new ones. Yeah, absolutely. Again, mm. whatever the West does. Whatever the West does. Turmeric latte. Mm. So, which is now, of course, old. But <laughs> You saw last 2000. I know. Uh, I know. Pre-pandemic. Turmeric latte. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Coming back. Yeah. Supplements. You said mm-hmm. supplements is an important okay. one. Of course. So, step one is how do we get people out of this mindset about supplements are bad for you? And that supplements equal to medicine. Like, how do you tell people that supplements are, you know, good? So, you know, I see both sides of the spectrum. I have patients who come to me with like 30 supplements Mm. and say, why are my reports looking like this? Mm. I eat 30 supplements a day. Mm. And I'm like, they're called supplements for a reason. (laughs) They supplement your lifestyle. Throw those 30 in the dustbin. Mm. Change your lifestyle. You won't need one, I promise you. Mm. So you have those sort of people also. Mm. Now to answer your question, supplements are great. A, I need a blood work done. Mm. I need to see if you are really low and you need something, Mm. either on your blood work or your symptoms. Only then will I prescribe you based on your medication, etc, etc. If you don't need it, I'm okay with you not taking any supplements. If you tell me my diet is clean, my lifestyle is good. So it's not like everybody needs multiple supplements. I don't take more than two supplements a day. Mm. So it doesn't matter. So it's not like you need to convince somebody because if somebody is coming to me with like say a vitamin D deficiency, I just have to put out the facts in front of the patient and say, okay, this is what your, you know, deficiency is going to do for you. You make the call and most people are intelligent enough to realize and especially when you can put two and two together and say the lack of this is causing this that you're complaining about, right? So you put things in perspective and they're like, oh really, you know, and if I take it, will that change? I'm like, Try it. Mm. Not for two weeks, I didn't. Mm. But <laughs> Longer. <laughs> two bottles. <laughs> well, it depends on what your value is and how long you need it. But then they see a difference. Mm. And I think most people are intelligent. They understand. You haven't faced an issue with... Because people look at me and, and my supplements and always have a heart attack. I'm, I'm the part that has 25 supplements. Yeah, so, huh? so now... Mm. Supplements are also broken up into, for example, your vitamins and like vitamin D, magnesium, and minerals and vitamins. Yeah. And also into things like Ashwagandha, yeah. Brahmi, yeah. those kinds of supplements, right? Um, how do you hold these two? What? How do you think of these two differently? Are they the same? Like, how would you? So I don't comment or prescribe on the Ashwagandha, Brahmi type at all hmm. because that's not my area of expertise. So I don't pretend to be an expert on that, Correct. right? I don't know anything. So... If something I, I know based on, you know, what we've read, but mm. that's not enough. Mm. right? That's not informed enough. So I tell my patients, if you want to do that, you again, the way you've come to me, go to somebody who's an expert in that. And that person is not me. And I'm not mm. going to bullshit about it. And make sure you tell, tell that Ayurveda or naturopath or whoever you're going to, that this, these are the allopathic medicines, because very often you have drug interactions. Correct. And there is no drug interaction. That's all I'm concerned with. Then you take what you like. Mm. So I don't prescribe those. Fair enough. Okay, so that would be out of your yes, well, the realm at all. Okay, great. So supplements, take them, but after you do your blood work and what your doctor says. What was the final one? We've covered five, I think. What was the one that we we're missing out? Movement. No, there were five. No, so there, there was there was food, there was food, diet, diet, sleep. Mm. Uh, food and diet same, no? Huh. Mm. So you're covering your diet. You're covering mm. sleep. Sleep. Um, gut health. Mm. Supplements. Exercise. Exercise. So movement, exercise. Yeah, that's right. Right. So uh, ha- when you prescribe movement, do you say walk for 30 hours, not 30 minutes? Do you say exercise in the gym? How do you typically get that? Again, Ashton, it's bio-individuality, right? Hmm. At the end of the day, I can't tell a 60-year-old or 70-year-old woman who's never exercised, go to, go to a gym and start lifting weights. She, she think I'm a little cookie. Correct. So, I mean, it depends on where you are. And but is there a minimum dose that you recommend? So, the American Heart Association says about 150 minutes of cardio, hmm. of just walking a hmm. week, hmm. which is nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So, hmm. just doing that. And if you're above 40, then 20, 30 minutes of some form of functional, even hmm. twice a week. Okay. And role of it's building muscle mass through this. Which is why you do that 20, 30 minutes twice a week at least, mm. right? Because that is very hugely important. Mm. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and, and age and, and muscle. Why is it important in the scheme of things? Okay, so there is um, something called sarcopenia, okay. which typically happens about the age of 50, which basically is muscle wasting. And it means your, your bones and muscles get weak. 
it reduces your immunity like almost cripples can cripple you if it uh, so it reduces by about one percent every year now do the math i mean if it's, you're going to reduce your muscle mass one percent every year at the age of like 45 or 50 by the time you're 70 or 80 you're 30 percent down so your immunity goes down the last thing you want to do is be a 70 year old and have a fall and break a muscle or break a bone and not be able to um you know get back to your day-to-day -day activity because your surgery has not gone well because you can't heal well because so you need to take care of bone health, bone health, I think. And there are so many studies now to show that functional training helps with longevity. Mm. So that's also very important. So you, because it's not just your lifespan, it's the quality of your life. Correct. So you want to live, I'd much rather live 10 years shorter, but live healthy than live, you know, like a cripple for that extra decade. So you need to do what it takes. And that doesn't mean you need to lift weights and you need to go to a gym. You can do functional, you can use your own body weight. You can do yoga, you can do Pilates, whatever you're comfortable with. Swimming is a great weight-bearing exercise also, as is walking, really. Mm. So you can do any of it, but it's absolutely essential. And then also it helps things like for people who are looking at weight loss because your metabolic rate goes up if you're, you know, if you, you're building muscle. So it, it's great in every aspect. Yeah, like when you grow old, you don't want to not be able to get up off a chair, you know. And we typically take these signs as old age signs, but it's not necessary. These are things that will happen if you don't make these interventions earlier on. Absolutely correct. Right? And you build for that. Yes. It's not that once it happens and you start panicking and saying, Are, it is old age, it's what's happening to me. Absolutely correct. Also on that note, I'd like to say, I have a lot of patients who come to me who will say that but we're taking calcium supplements. I was, my next question was oh, calcium. Oh, I see. I can read your mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, you know, they, they'll say, you know, uh, we're taking calcium supplements. Our bone is in great health. You know, we don't need to exercise. Did you do it excess care? And not only that, are you taking the right kind of calcium? Where is that calcium going? Mm. Is it going to your bones or is it causing a blockage in your heart? <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> Correct? So, so what is the th 30 seconds on calcium huh? and calcium and milk? Those are the two typical questions that keep okay. coming up. Okay. So A, I'm not a big fan of milk. Mm. For those people who don't have a gut issue, who are taking, you know, organic grass-fed milk and who don't have a problem, sure, go ahead and take it. Mm. Is it offering you anything? Should you start taking milk just because it's giving you 200 mg of calcium in one glass? Hell no. Mm. Right? So if it's part of your life and no issue and you're doing it, you know, organically, like I said, go ahead and have it. No problem. But uh, it might have other issues, but that's mm. for another time. Um, in fact, I was reading about this, the calcium that comes from milk is not the calcium that we end up using. It's bioavailable and correct. Yeah, that's correct. Mm. Yeah. But even with calcium, mm. 30 seconds, Ashton, mm. you, <laughs> you, you, you need to have calcium with K2. You need to have calcium with magnesium mm. because it's the K2 that decides, the vitamin K that decides where the calcium actually goes and you know, gets utilized. Mm. Is it going to the bones? Is it going to your heart? Is it going so you require vitamin K2 for that? So if you're taking a calcium supplement, make sure you're having adequate vitamin K. Now, again, I have a lot of people who don't like, oh, that, that that's, you know, your uh, part of the question mm. where people who don't like to take supplements, should we take another K2? Because mm. people also read a lot of stuff that Dr. Google. So, you know, we have enough um, vegetables. Mm. So it gives us vitamin K2. No, you're not going to get enough. You, you have to take that supplement. Mm. And you also need magnesium because magnesium uh, also makes your calcium bioavailable. So you, you need both calcium and uh, you know, with your magnesium and your K2. And of course, you need vitamin D, D. when you're taking calcium. Correct. So all four of them. So awesome. if you're taking it, take it correctly. Huh. Otherwise, because otherwise I, I pop my chewable calciums and you see, I started going to the gym. So I started taking calcium. No, don't do it that way. You have to understand how it is actually being used in the body. You get yes. behind the science only then start using these. Yeah. Um, like you were saying that, your food is not going to give you enough nutrients, especially magnesium. Mm -hmm. Our food supply does not have enough magnesium because the magnesium from our soil has been depleted. Yes. So you need to take magnesium as a supplement and magnesium is such an important um, element in our body. Yeah, so for, so many, things, for so, so many things. For sleep, for muscle relaxation, for people who work out in the gym, you know, it helps with muscle recovery. It's hugely beneficial. You know? Correct. We need to get that in. Yeah. And food is not going to be the answer for that. Yeah, it keeps the, the blood vessels of the heart, you know, um, nice and soft so you don't get hypertension it reduces heart rate pulse rate your, your pulse rate comes down so during covid i actually saw so many people with so much anxiety mm. and i would just tell them to take a magnesium supplement and it would bring the pulse rate down bring it down brilliant yeah, yeah. there's so many things that you can do with 
just with lifestyle intervention. I think that's mm-hmm. that's a fantastic place to end our podcast. Use our lifestyle interventions so that a you don't get these issues as you go up, yeah. and if you do have these issues, you can reverse them. It is not forever. I think that's a big yeah, one. and don't please think that you are born with a predicament if your parents have, you know, heart disease or diabetes that you're. That's your fate. Not at all. There's something called epigenetics. I, you know, the genes just load the bullet, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. I love it. Yeah, I love it too. <laughs> so, yeah. so in fact, my entire TEDx talk was on this in epigenetics on really? how our habits are actually what are inherited from our parents as well as the genes. The so genes. we blame our habits as much as we blame our genes for that. You know, I just thought of another quote, not not relevant to this, but mm. something I tell my patients is again something I said yesterday from from Mary Poppins. Mm. You know, there's this thing that says a, a little a teaspoon of sugar mm. takes the med- makes mm. the medicine go down. I'm like, that's probably the reason you need the medicine. <laughs> 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 and on that anti-sugar note, from two anti-sugar yeah. people, <laughs> we're going to end our podcast. Doctor V, thank you so much for coming on the Happy Coach my podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yay. So, Vishaka, how can people get in touch with you? How can they continue this conversation with you? Um, I practice out of a clinic in Cuff Parade in Bombay. And, of course, I have uh, patients from all over the world. You can reach out to me on my Instagram. Uh, my handle is Dr. V. It's D-O-C-T-O-R-V-E-E. That's what I'm actually known as, Dr. V, everywhere. Perfect. And if they can get in touch with you, can they? Uh, do you reply to DMs and they message you there? me or someone on my team will fantastic all right so that's how you can get in touch with dr b lovely